Last week we started this, and this week, by the grace of God, we will finish this part of the series. Hopefully there might be another message coming, not next week, but a week after that, that will be still part of the series. And I trust God to speak to us next week as well through Pastor Amy Iguan. Amen. Amen. Okay, now let's read together. We know that our verse, let's read it together if you can read with me, go. Jesus traveled through all the towns and villages of that area, teaching in the synagogue and announcing the good news about the kingdom, and he healed every kind of diseases, just like he just did right now, healing every kind. He's still doing the same. Amen. When he saw the crowd, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless, like sheep without shepherd. And he said to his disciples, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. That's what we're dealing with. We've talked about the harvest is great. We are now talking about the workers of few. And in this message, what we're dealing with is how to bring in the harvest. In other words, how to become a worker. Amen. And then he says, so pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Amen. Ask him to send in more workers into the field. The question here is, do we still need more workers? Absolutely. The population of the people, the, the harvest is growing every day. We have <laughs> how many billion people in the world? Is it 8 billion? Yes. So we have about 8 billion harvest. <laughs> Doesn't matter their religion, Hindu, Muslim, whatever, whatever they believe. They are harvest. Even Christians are also part of harvest because at the end of the day, what we need is God reviving people, bringing them back into his life to experience his life and live also his life here on earth. Amen. Amen. So that's our text. We know this already. And I mentioned to us last week the question, who's the Lord in charge of the harvest? And we say this to Holy Spirit. Now, when you say the Holy Spirit, we're not saying that it's not Jesus. We're not saying that it's not God. It's just that we're saying the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is the one that activates us here on earth. And he's the one that lives in us now. And he's the one that is operating with us here, doesn't mean. So if you have the Holy Spirit, you have God. If you have the Jesus, you have the Father. So they are all one God. So, And so we talked about that. And I also said to, uh, gave us point number one last week. And what was that? Anyone can shout it out if you remember. Point number one on how to bring in the harvest. Be led by the, be led by the be full of the Holy Spirit, which simply means be led by the Holy Spirit. That's the first thing. You cannot bring in harvest without the leadership of the Holy Spirit, okay? Jesus told the disciples, don't do anything, just go and stay. In a few days, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You will receive the Holy Spirit that the Father promised. And it's the same for us. And you saw that the apostles, the disciples, don't jump without the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Okay, I also mentioned that last week. I said the early church always prayed for the Holy Spirit to empower them afresh. This is what you would call revival, to revive them whenever they face any challenge. In the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4, verse 29 and 31, I'm not going to read it because of time. So you, they always, when they face challenges, guess what they do? They don't go and pray against the situation, which is sometimes what we tend to do. We tend to go and pray against the situation we're facing, against the devil, against, and I'm, I'm going to mention this later on, you will see a bit more on this. No, what they pray is that they say to God, hear their threat, but our concern is not their threat. Our concern is us. We ask that you strengthen us. Raise up your, by the power of your spirit, raise, lift up your mighty hand and give us boldness. Heal through our hands. Three, heal through your wonderful hands, which simply means us. Amen. The aim here is for us to become workers. The aim here is for us to pray in line with the scripture that Jesus said, which is to pray for the Lord of the harvest, to bring in harvest. So here's where we stopped and where we're going to start this week's talk. Amen. Amen. So point number two, pray for people. Hallelujah. Pray for people 
in according to God's word. You know, Simon, when I told Simon to do, com um, sorry, offering this morning, and I, I, I said to him, whatever the Holy Spirit puts in your heart to share, share. Now, he didn't know my second point. And then he just said to me, texted me the Jude from verse 17 to 25 that he read and said, I don't know why God put this scripture in my heart, but I, I'm just going to read. Uh, I don't know why this scripture. And I said to him, just read it. You don't know why God put it in your heart. And of course, I know. <laughs> Because the scripture talks about exactly what I'm talking about. Where we are starting from today, which is to pray for people. Where in verse, we read it already and we prayed in line with that scripture that Simon brought. Verse 20 says, But you, dear friends, must build each other up in your most holy faith. Doing what? Praying in the power of the Holy Spirit. But I like the word. It says, build each other up. Amen. Not build just yourself, build each other up. And he says, who, um, and wait for the mercy of God and other. And then he says, you must show mercy to those who, whose faith are wavering. Praise God. Pray for one another. Pray for people. That's how we bring in the harvest. Pray for people. Jesus said, the harvest is great. Pray for people. Pray to God to bring in the people, to bring in the workers. The workers are people. Amen. The harvest is great. Pray that God will raise men and women. Is that, think about that statement. Solution to the problem is people. Being activated by the Holy Spirit and released to the work of God. That's the solution to the problem. Many times we tend to pray for other things instead of praying specifically for people that are involved in those things. You know, this statement might sound, what, what are you talking about? I took a time to study this, okay? And I realized that majority of the time, Jesus prayed specifically for people. Not the situation, not the condition, not the what is happening. For example, if there's a riot right now, Jesus will not pray for the riot. He will pray for the people. There's a difference praying for a situation happening than there's a difference praying for the people involved in that situation. And when you do that specifically, the Holy Spirit gives you words and gives you insight of what the enemy is trying to do to those people or through those people. Hallelujah. Amen. Okay, I'll give us examples in the scripture. Jesus, in the, um, Paul, first of all, said to Timothy, I urge you, let's read this together. It's a good scripture for us. I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. Ask God to help them intercede on their behalf and give thanks for them. Pray this way for who? Kings and all who are in authority. Let's pause for a minute. It simply means those in government the same way you prayed for the first group of people, which is, what is it that you said? Intercede on their behalf. Okay, what is it that you're interceding on their behalf? Ask God to help them. So is that saying Boris Johnson or whoever, Joe Biden, Father, I thank you for Joe Biden. I pray that you will help him in the name of Jesus. I pray on his behalf. I pray for his family. I pray for his wife, his children. I pray for his health. I pray for his strength, that you give him wisdom, that he help him make the right decisions. Amen. Amen. That's what the scripture says. Pray this way, not pray that God will, you know, bad things, because God wouldn't do that anyway. That's not what he's asking us to do. He's asking us to pray good for people. Hallelujah. Amen. Why should we do that? Read on. So that we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked with godliness and dignity. Let me look at, let's think of that quickly together. So instead of praying for peace and quietness, pray for people so you can have peace and quietness. That's, that's what the scripture is saying. It didn't say pray for peace and quietness, forget about the people involved that could make that peace and quietness happen. No, he's saying pray for those who can bring about that peace and quietness so that you will have peace and quietness. 
That's why I said we tend to pray for things more than we pray for individuals, the people involved in those things. Holy Spirit, I believe, is bringing this. Now, it's not, don't, I'm not, it's not in a condemning way. It's just to say, to open our eyes to be a bit more um, strategic, if that's the word, but scripturally strategic in our praying. Praise God. Now, it says, this is good and pleases God, our Savior, who wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. Do you want people to understand the truth? Pray for them individually. Do you feel people don't hear the truth? Pray for them individually. Stop praying that the devil, praying against the, you know, things around them. Just pray for them specifically. Find out that their eyes will be opened, that they may hear you, that they will know you, and things like that. Amen. Okay. I'm going to give us a lot of scripture on this point. Jesus and the apostles prayed specifically for people, not just for the land or the city. Now, this might sound again controversial, but I'm not trying to be controversial. I'm just saying that I actually Googled to find where Jesus or the apostles prayed for the land or the city. And I couldn't find any. So please, I would like you guys to correct me at the home church. Maybe I'm missing something. And they say a very, very strong chance that I'm missing something. Amen. Very, very strong chance. So this might be a homework for all of us. Now, Jesus spoke about places. He said, Jerusalem, oh Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets, they are people. You know, they are leaders and things like that. He said to, woe to you, Tyre and Sidon, for if what was said to you, and you know, he said things over places. But when he wants to pray to the Father, he prayed for people. He prayed specifically for people. Both Jesus and all the apostles. And I feel there's a good example for us to learn. Okay, remember we're talking about bringing in the harvest. Now look at Jesus' prayer for to Peter. He says, Simon, Simon, Satan has d d done what? Asked to sift you, to sift, is that correct? Yeah, sift yeah. you, sift, sift each, each of you like with. The word sift, let me just say quickly, dictionary meaning of sift. Like this, he says to examine something thoroughly so as to what? Isolate. Isolate. You know, sifting means, uh, you know, where you separate the shaft from the, you know, the, the, lumps, yeah, from the yeah, the lumps from the fine, fine bits. Thank you. Now, if it's Jesus that is sifting you, he's removing something that is not needed in you, isn't it? Yes, yes. Yeah. So that the good things can be kept. Yes. Now. When the Satan is trying to save, when a bad person is trying to save, what he's looking for is not the good. He's trying to take away the good in you so that he could isolate the bad things in you and expose it. But I like that word thoroughly to isolate. That's exactly what the Satan wanted to do to Simon. And that's exactly what he did. And Jesus, this scripture I find interesting. Now, Jesus said that Satan has asked to um, save to you, each of you, like wait, but I have prayed ple and, and I have pleaded in prayer for you, Simon, that your faith should not fail. And when you are re have repented, return to me again and return to me again, strengthen your brothers. Now that made me think a little bit. I, I was thinking, if Satan is coming to ask for this, why shouldn't Jesus be rebuking Satan? Why shouldn't Jesus be casting out the devil and binding the spirit? Why should he just even entertain that conversation in the first place? No, he focused on praying for Peter. He just said, I have played, pleaded for your faith. I'm only praying that your faith will be strong. I'm only praying that when you fall, you will get back up again because the wisdom of God is bigger than anything the devil is doing. Satan thinks he, he got Jesus when he nailed him on the cross, but that's actually his own downfall. And in the same way, Satan thought he would get Peter by attacking Peter. That's also Satan's downfall. So instead of focusing on the wrong things we're praying sometimes, focus on the scriptural, praying according to the scripture and the examples that we have with the scriptures. Amen. And so he says uh, that I prayed for you, strengthen others. And guess what? The next line, Peter said, oh, <laughs> Jesus, no way. I'm going to die with you. Wherever you go, I go. Nothing will happen. And guess what? The next morning, 
Jesus told him, you're going to betray me. This will happen anyway. But I've prayed that you'll be. And guess what the devil did? According to that dictionary explanation, devil isolated Peter. How do I know that? These disciples have always been together. So how come Peter ended up in the crowd by the fire alone with some people that he doesn't know that now starts telling him, hey, you look like one of them. You look like one of them. He ended up denying Jesus and that hit him, his faith, big time, which made Jesus come to strengthen him later. Praise God. My point is that God wants us to pray for people. Jesus prayed for people specifically. Let's read a few scriptures here. He says, my prayer is not for the world, but for those who you have given me. I'm not praying general prayers here, Father. I'm praying specifically for people here. I'm praying for the people you've given me because they belong to you. I'm going to jump around here. Now I'm departing from this world. They are staying in this world, but I'm, not, I'm coming to you, Holy Father. You have given me your name, but protect. Now do what? Protect them by the power of your name so that they will be united just as we are united. I am not asking you to take them out of this world, but keep them safe from the evil one. Amen. Amen. They do not belong to this world any more than I do. Make them holy by your truth. By, the, by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. I am praying not only. Now, he didn't just pray for the disciples that were standing next to him. He started praying for people who, King James, Cheesy, Amy, all of you who are watching right now, Dave, Simon, started praying for all of us. He said, I'm praying, not only praying for these disciples, but I'm also praying for Duke, who for in, in the future believe in me. Amen. Through the message of these disciples. Again, specifically praying for people. I pray that they will not will be, that they will all be one, just as we are one, as we are. As you are in me, Father, I am in you, and may, they, and may they be in us so that the world will believe that you've sent me. Praise God. Specific praying for people. I'm still on this same point. How do we bring in the harvest? You pray for people. Be led by the Holy Spirit. Pray for people. I can give us so many examples of the apostle Paul. Just go through few of them. I'm not going to read the scriptures. Uh, Paul prayed, thank God for each one of his people. That's the scriptures for that. Paul prayed for their wisdom and knowledge. Scriptures for that. Paul prayed that they would be full of hope. Paul prayed for that they would live in peace and unity. Paul prayed that they would be strengthened with spiritual power. He also prayed that they would learn to abide in Christ Jesus. These are all different prayers Paul is making for specifically for people. He also prayed that they would grow in their love for others. He prayed for their righteousness and purity. He prayed that they would flow, overflow with praise and thanks to God. Paul also prayed for opportunity to be able to minister to these people. Take your time if you want. Go through some of those scriptures. I wouldn't have time to read all of that. Point number three on this is share your story. Share your story. This is what makes you an authentic witness of Jesus. So let's say that together. Three points. Be full of the Holy Spirit in order to bring in the harvest or revival. Pray for people specifically as the Spirit leads according to the Word of God, and share your story. That's what makes you an authentic witness of Jesus. Friends, the Scripture is, these things are very clear in the Scripture. People who shared their story and turned communities around. They shared their story. They didn't, they're not experts. But let me just show us one, the Scripture. The Bible says in the book of John chapter 39, Many Samaritans from that village, from the village, believed in who? Jesus, because 
the woman said had because of because the woman had said he told me everything I ever did. Just think about this. Many, many people. So that woman must have just run into this, the woman at the well, Samaritan woman at the well, when Jesus prophesied to him and told her about her life, she just left Jesus, went back into the city. She wasn't preaching the gospel, the book of Torah, what Moses said and all of that. All he said is that, come and see a man who have told me everything about me. Could he be the Messiah? Praise God. And many people believed in Jesus because of that. But I love the fact that they didn't stop there. The Bible says when they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in the village. So he stayed for two days. Long enough for more, for many more to hear his message and believe. Then he said to the, they said to the woman, now we believe not just because of what you told us, but because we heard him ourselves. Now we know that he is indeed the savior of the world. But how did this revival break out in, the, in Samaria? How did revival break out in the whole, for the whole Samaritans? Through a woman who did not hesitate to share her story. Amen. Amen. Just by sharing your own story, God can turn a whole city around. Share your testimony. You know, sometimes we, when you say preach the gospel, people get scared. Let's be honest. Maybe if I ask the young people here, ask Sarah Duke, if I tell you now, go and preach the gospel, does, what does that come, what comes to your mind? Do you, you can't really do it, he said. It, not enough knowledge. Not en Sarah said, not enough knowledge to preach the gospel. Friends, you don't need to be an expert in theology to share your own story. Amen. And that's what this woman did. She wasn't an expert in theology, but revival came through her. All she did was just go into the town and said, come and see what he did for me. Let me read. I'm going to end with a long scripture now. Okay. And we're going to read the scripture and then hopefully pray. Because this story, I wanted to read the whole chapter, but I'm going to jump around just to save time. You don't need to be an expert. Sarah said, sometimes when you say preach the gospel, you're thinking, but I don't know this, I don't know that, I don't know that. You don't need any of that. Any believer of Jesus can be a, an authentic witness. Can you say that with me? Any believer of Jesus can be an authentic witness of Jesus. Praise God. You don't need to know when he's coming back again, which year he's coming, which month. No, mm -mm. And this is what stops many people from becoming walkers because they feel they don't know enough. So they leave it for the pastors, the teachers, the evangelists to do the work. No, every one of us can share our story. You don't have to be on the high street to share your story. You have friends, don't you? Sometimes I say to my son, I'm sorry, Duke, forgive me for this. I say to my son, have you invited your friends to what you're doing? Uh, mm, yeah. I said, don't you think what you're doing is important? Don't you think that, why do you think that they will not want to? Why do you assume? Why do you assume that they wouldn't want to be part of what you're involved in? Amen. And that's why we don't have workers. Why? Because we're thinking it's for the big guys, for the big boys, or for the big girls, or something like that. No, it's every single one of us. Favor House people, I'm speaking to you right now. Every one of you is a preacher of the gospel. Praise God. Every single one. No one is called to sit in the pews and enjoy. From the top to the bottom, from Soludo, from Sochika, all the way to the biggest person in this church, every one of you can preach the gospel. Jesus preached the gospel at age 12. I bet he did it even younger than that. But at least 12 was recorded for us. Amen. Share your story. Let's read the scripture. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. I'm going to jump around a bit. Okay, just to save time. Then he spat on the ground. What I missed there is that the disciples asked, 
how is this man born blind? Was he that sinned or his mother that sinned or whatever? Jesus said, none of that. It's so that the power of God might be seen. Okay. Verse 6. Then he spat on the ground, made mud with saliva and sp spread. Eh? This is Jesus. Jesus, yeah. Jesus spat on the ground. Thank you so much. <laughs> then Jesus spat on the ground, made mud uh, uh, with saliva and spread the mud over the blind man's eyes. He told him, go wash yourself in the pool of Siloam. Is that correct? Siloam means scent. That's interesting. So the man went and washed and came back seeing. That's a miracle. He was born blind. Now he can see. Amen. His neighbors and others who knew him as a blind beggar asked each other, is this the man who used to sit and beg? Some said he was, others said, no, he just looks like him. But the beggar kept saying, praise God. The beggar kept saying what? Yes, I am the same one. That's, a, that's just the beginning of him sharing his story. Don't let people shut you up when God has healed you. Don't let people to excuse it and tell you it is this reason or that reason. No, say, I don't know. All I know is that this is, I, he helped me. He saved me. Okay, how does he save? I don't know. He just saved me. I, I'm not a theology expert on how Jesus saves yet, but I know he saved me. Praise God. And he, let's read on. He says, then, he, then they asked him, who healed you? What happened? He told them, the man they called Jesus, they call him Jesus, made mud, spread it over my eyes, Put and told me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash yourself. So I went and washed, and now I can see. He's sharing his story. When, where, where is he now? They asked him. <laughs> I like this. Where is the man that you do? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. That doesn't matter to him. What matters is that I am healed. Amen. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. Then they took the man who they took the man who had been blind to the Pharisees. Because it was on the Sabbath that Jesus had made the mud and healed him. The Pharisees asked him, the man, all the all about it. So he told them, he put mud. See how he's sharing his story, friends. That's the whole reason I'm reading this. The scripture is doing this preaching here. He's sharing the story. He put mud in over my eyes, and when I washed it, I could see. He's not changing anything. This is what I mean by being authentic. You don't have to pretend to talk about what God hasn't done for you. Amen. Talk about what he's done for you. You know, you don't have to be an expert explaining how he has raised the dead. What has he done for you? Share that story. That's what you need. And once you're doing that, you'll be authentic. <clears throat> Amen. Then the Pharisees asked the man, thank you, thank you, son. Excuse me, excuse me, everyone. Then the Pharisees asked the man who had been blind and demanded, what's your opinion about this man who healed you? The man replied, I think he must be a prophet. Again, he's not a theological expert. He doesn't know Jesus. He must be a prophet. Then the Jewish leader still, still refused to believe the man had been blind and could now see. So they called his parents. They asked them, it is, is this your son? Was he born blind? If so, how, how can he see now? Three questions there. The parents replied, we know this is our son. First question answered. And, we, and that he was born blind. Second question answered. But the third question, they say, we don't know how he can see and who healed him. Ask him, he's old enough to speak for himself. Of course, they said that because they are afraid of the people. I'm going to jump now. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind and told him, God should get the glory for this because we know this man, Jesus, is a sinner. I don't know whether he's a sinner, <laughs> the man replied. 
but I know this. I was blind, but now I can see. Praise God. That's that song there. Amazing grace. How sweet the song. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Praise God. I don't know if Jesus is this or that or this. What I know is that I used to be full of um, turmoil in my heart. And when I gave my life to Jesus, I have peace. That's your story. I don't know what the doctors, all I, what, what they said, whether he heals or not. All I know is that the doctors told me this cancer cannot be healed. And I went to a church and they prayed for me. Now I am healed. Doctors have confirmed it. Jesus healed me. I don't know how he did it, but he did it. Stick with that. Praise God. And revival will happen through you. That's what God wants us to say. You shall be my witnesses. Praise God. Preaching the gospel. The gospel is your, his story and your story as well. Amen. But what did you, what, um, this, uh, and then he goes, but what did he do? They asked him, how did he heal you? Look, the man, exclaimed, the man is getting angry now. I told you once, <clears throat> you didn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Then they cursed him and said, you are his disciple, but you are, but we are the disciples of Moses. We know God spoke to, Mo to Moses, but we don't even know whether this man, where this, sorry, we don't even know where this man comes from. Watch the next line. The man says, why? That's very strange. The, the man replied, he healed my eyes, and yet you don't know where he's from. He's now moving through slowly from just sharing his story to teaching. Watch this. He healed my eyes, and yet you still say, you are the people who, religious leaders, you still say you don't know where he's from. We know the man is teaching now. We know that God doesn't listen to sinners. <clears throat> but he is ready. He listens to, sorry, he is ready to hear those who worship him and do his will. Ever since the world began, the man is teaching all of a sudden. You see what I mean? By sharing your story, all of a sudden confidence is growing. The Holy Spirit is helping him or whatever is happening. He's just logic. He's even using logic to preach the gospel. Ever since the world began, no one has ever been able to open the eyes of the blind, of anyone, someone born blind. If this man, logic, if this man were not from God, he, could have, he couldn't have done this. And of course, they, they didn't receive that. They say, you, you were a total sinner. You, you were born a total sinner, they answered. Now you're trying to teach us. So they've already understand. All of a sudden, truth, truth that is coming from an authentic witness is too strong for them to handle. Friends, God wants us to be this way. Amen. And then Jesus, and when Jesus, and this is why I'm heading, we're going to end with this, okay? When Jesus heard what happened, friends, before you read this, it's not so many people that Jesus healed and he went to look for. Just think about it with me. But this particular story, when Jesus heard what happened, he himself went to find this man. He went and found the man and asked him, do you believe in the Son of Man? Praise God. I think this is very significant. Jesus realized, wow, an unbeliever is actually preaching the gospel. Someone who doesn't believe in me has been able to spread the good news about me better than most people who even believe in me. He went to find the man. Why did he go to find the man? Look at it. So that the man will believe properly. He says, the man said, the man answered, who is he, sir? I want to believe in him. And then Jesus said, you have seen him, Jesus said, and he is the one speaking to you. Lord, yes, Lord, I believe, the man said, and Jesus, and he worshipped Jesus. That's when the man became born again. So he's a zero expert in the gospel. Amen. Zero expert. He was born blind, born a sinner, everything you can think of, 
but he was able to share his story with the religious teachers, those who think they are wiser than any, you know, even Jesus, those who think they know the Bible and everything, but this man stood his ground. Nothing they said sh sh shifted him. Why? Because it's not just spouting knowledge. Okay, most times when we go to share the gospel, we're going there to share knowledge. Stop sharing knowledge. Share your story. Who am I speaking to right now? I feel God is speaking to someone. Forget about sharing knowledge. Forget about trying to share how the, uh, this asteroid came together and that asteroid came and then this one. You're those are knowledge. Stick to your story. Amen. Because no one can deny your story. No one can take that away from you. You know when God healed you. You know when God revived you. You know when God helped you. You know when God healed your mom. You know when you were confused and he brought con direction. Stick to that story. Amen. Amen. And you will see revival around you. You see the people, your neighbors, your sisters. Again, let, be led by the Holy Spirit. Pray for those people. Tell them your stories. Amen. Amen. And see God do the work. See God do the work. I have fr friends, I have brothers. Instead of me going to tell my brother how, give him the, all the exegesis and how Christianity is the best idea for you. No, 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 no. Just how I keep telling him my story. How God, I don't know, I know you don't believe in God, but I know that he helped me. He cares for me. He's directing me. He gives me wisdom. I, I, would, I would have been stupid today if not for God. That's my story. No one can take that away from you. Then Jesus told him, I entered this world to render just judge, judgment, to give sight to the blind, and to show those who think they see that they are blind. Amen. Amen. Those people who think they know, they don't know anything. But those who can just trust God for the simplicity of the word of God to go through them will be the ones he will use in these last days. In conclusion, friends, ask the Holy Spirit to lead you daily. That's what we want to conclude with. Point number one, depend on the Holy Spirit's leadership daily. In, in other words, to bring to revival. Pray compassionately for people daily and then share boldly your authentic story. Amen. Can you remember this? Just re This is important in this series because God wants to activate us to become workers. Jesus is not saying pray to the Lord of the harvest to send in laborers into the harvest. Um, and then the aim is just so that you just keep praying. No, you are the laborer. You are the worker. Amen. And that's how he's going to use us to bring in harvest. Okay. I, I could just start telling you personally how God is challenging me to pray for people. But it's just it's going to make those kind of things sometimes make people feel unworthy and all of those things. I don't need to tell you where I go for prayer or how often I pray or those things. It's not necessary. I'm asking you to ask the Holy Spirit to help you daily to pray. To help you, first of all, daily for your own self. To lead you daily on your daily challenges. Ask for revival. Keep asking. When you think about revival, don't think about just reviving the nation. Don't think about reviving the, the Africa and all those things. No. Ask God, revive me. Revive me, Jesus. Revive me. Give, grant me that with boldness I will preach your gospel. Then pray specifically for people. If you want something to change in London, pray for those in London. Pray for the leader. Pray for the mayor of London and all those kind of people. And then boldly share your story within your neighborhood, within the people around you, and see what God is going to do through you. The harvest is great, but the laborers are few. So Father, we pray for laborers right now. In the name of Jesus, why don't you just lift up your hands just as a sign of surrender with me? Just lift up your hands as a sign of surrender. Let's just pray together. Father, we pray, God, that you help us. Um, that as we step in into a new season as a church, yes, a new season, a, a season of harvest, a season of revival, a season of, of your move and your outpouring and the things. It started with Limitless Conference, Father. I pray, God, that we, that you, that you help us individually to see our own personal responsibilities, our own personal responsibility in what you're trying to do. You're asking us to pray to you, Father, for laborers. And we pray right now that we want to be your laborers, God, in the name of Jesus. Revive us, Holy Spirit, 
grant us that with boldness we will preach the good news. That with boldness we will motivate one another. 